Okay, so B-side um, is an idea that I stumbled across uh, completely by accident. Um, a little over a year ago, I was writing a tutorial on SIDH, and I was trying to use Magma to, um, to produce a toy example. In fact, the toy example corresponds to the GIF that you can see on this title slide. And in using uh, Magma to try and derive this toy example, I stumbled across something that was really confusing to me. I, I thought it was a bug in Magma, um, but then once I realized what was going on, essentially that, um, that what I thought was a bug gave birth to the idea that ended up being ended up being B-side. Um, now I think that down the track, um, if if some problems can be solved, in, in particular if, if computing large uh, prime degree isogenies can be accelerated, I, I actually think that B-side might um, end up being the way to go as far as isogeny based key exchange goes. It, it might be as performant, maybe even more performant than, than SIDH and Psyche. Um, but I'd like to start the talk by essentially reliving the um, the mistake or the the what I thought was a, a mistake that I stumbled upon and, and kind of explaining how that gave rise to how that gave rise to to B side. Okay, to set up this um, this toy example, this example that I used in the tutorial, um, I chose a prime, the prime 431, which is the same shape as all of the real world SIDH and psych primes. It's two to the four times three to the three minus one. Um, and of course, built the extension field FP squared. Um, and then I just asked Magma um, using this super singular invariance function, um, which only takes the, the prime as input. And basically it outputs uh, the set of um, the set of J invariants that uh, corresponds to all of the nodes in the super singular isogeny graph. So magma, as we know, the, the um, this is always very close to P over 12. So in this case, I think there's 37 nodes in the in the toy example. Maybe one of them's hidden under me, but um, that's all of the J invariants there that are that are super singular over this this uh, prime characteristic. And Magma output them, so all was fine. And I started drawing the uh, the super singular isogeny graph. No, no problems yet. And so the next order of business in drawing and depicting this toy example was to start drawing edges. I needed to draw edges in the two isogeny graph for Alice, and edges in the three isogeny graph for Bob. Um, you'll see those graphs a little later on. But to do this, I was going to essentially do things exactly the same way that they work, uh, that SIDH and Psych computes isogenies in, in practice, which is to find points of order two and points of order three on, on curves that correspond to these J invariants, and to use those uh, points as generators of the kernel to feed that into Velu's uh, formulas and then to, to output the, um, the, the nodes that are connected to, to each node. So I started going around uh, looking for these points of order two and points of order three on, on each of the curves in the graph. And the way to do this in, in Magma was to um, use the elliptic curve from J invariant function, which on input of a J invariant outputs an elliptic curve that's in the isomorphism class corresponding to one of those, uh, to, to any given node in the graph. Um, and so I was doing that for a while and computing points of order two and points of order three on, on uh, representative curves at, at each node. But for some of the cur for, for some of the nodes in the graph, I, I wasn't able to find points of order two and points of order three over FP squared, um, which for a little for a little while started to confuse me. I was thinking, what's going on? Um, every all of these curves are isogenous, which means they should have the same number of points. Um, but I can't find points of order two and points of order three. So then when I started to compute the the group orders of the the representative curves that were um, that were spat out by magma, I started to see that basically there was two two different group orders being um, being uh, produced here by magma's elliptic curve from J invariant function. There was the group order uh, P plus one all squared, and there was the group order P minus one all squared. And then I remembered that essentially in SIDH and psych, um, we've been making a choice uh, for, uh, for, um, 
for p plus one all squared. So we've been using p plus one all squared as the as the group orders. Um, and I originally was thinking, oh, we we kind of need to choose one or the other. Um, but the essence of this paper and the idea that came from observing this um, this mistake that's I guess thankful to Magma's elliptic curve from J invariant function. Um, the essence is that we don't need to make a choice between uh, using the group order P plus one all squared or the group order P minus one all squared. In fact, we can use both of those group orders um, because essentially the uh, each node in the super singular isogeny graph corresponds to uh, there's a, there's elliptic curves uh, defined over FP squared who have group order P plus one all squared and there's elliptic curves defined over FP squared that have group order P minus one all squared and both of these choices are valid at each node in the super singular isogeny graph. So each, each node isn't red or green, in fact each node is both red and green. Uh, so in, he, in here I'm saying that each of these nodes is is yellow um, and roughly speaking the idea of B side is that Alice is going to work uh, with the P plus one all squared group orders and Bob is going to work with the P minus one all squared group orders and in doing so there, there's kind of a, a, a whole um, a whole array of new options for instantiating uh, isogeny based cryptography. So just to reiterate, here's Alice, and she's going to work completely on the A side. Um, she works on the same set of nodes as Bob, uh, but she's going to work with elliptic curves and with torsion points um, whose orders divide P plus one. Um, or she's going to work with elliptic curves whose group orders are P plus one squared. Now, um, calling this the A side, not just because it corresponds to Alice, but because it's kind of where we fell by default in SRDH and Psyche. Um, there, we always kind of instantiate or, or write down the, the system parameters by starting with a, a subfield curve that's minimally defined over FP and then lifting it into FP squared. Now, when you um, consider the super singular elliptic curves over FP, there is only one group order over FP and that is P plus one. So when you lift that to, to FP squared, um, by default you kind of naturally fall into the A side. But when you consider the uh, possible group orders of super singular elliptic curves over FP squared, that's where you get more than one. And that's where we get this possibility for Bob, which is to work on the B side. So I've called it B side not just because it corresponds to Bob, but because it's kind of uh, an analogy to the to the the flip side of a record where um, which is kind of often the less popular side um, but that's or, or, or the forgotten side of a record and, and in this case p minus one all squared is kind of the forgotten group orders that that weren't really used in in SIDH and psych um, but so Bob's going to work with elliptic curves that are um, that, uh, that have group order P minus one all squared. So he's going to work only with torsion points whose order divides P minus one. Um, but again, Alice and Bob, they work on the same set of nodes. They're just gonna work with uh, different representative elliptic curves at each of those nodes. And the first piece of uh, good news for our purposes is that essentially there's no changes to the SIDH or psych protocol or to any of the kind of isogeny arithmetic that we need um, if we want to use the B side. Um, and that's uh, by virtue of the A side and the B side um, are actually the FP squared quadratic twists of each other. So on this slide, I've kind of zoomed into one node in the super singular isogeny graph. And in green is the curve or is a representative curve that Alice is going to use um, in Montgomery form. And in red is the representative curve that Bob's going to use in Montgomery form. Now, the only difference here, there's no difference in the A parameter. They use the same A. Um, the only difference here is that Bob is using a non-square B, whereas Alice's B is kind of one uh, by default. Um, and if you, 
if you use a non-square B, then you get the P minus one all squared group order that Bob uses. And if you use uh, uh, the, the curve in green, you get the P plus one all squared group order, which is what Alice is going to use. So, um, but the reason that the, that the arithmetic doesn't change is that all of the arithmetic that we use in state-of-the-art implementations um, is actually agnostic to whether you're working on the curve in the green oval or the curve in the red oval, whether you're working on the curve or twist. And so um, in the first yellow box there is, is uh, the X coordinate only scalar multiplications, which uh, pay no attention to whatever the Y coordinate was. Um, and they basically only use uh, X coordinates and the, um, the A coordinate of the curve, which is the same for the uh, Alice and Bob on the A side and the B side. The same goes for the isogeny arithmetic, which takes uh, X coordinates and curve parameters to um, X prime uh, and A prime um, in the second yellow box there. And again, that, that's the same arithmetic and the same explicit formulas whether you're on the A side or the B side. Um, and the J invariant of both of these curves is, is the same. So uh, technically speaking, these two curves, they have different group orders over FP squared. So they're not even isogenous over FP squared. Um, but if we lift to FP to the four, their quadratic extension field, then they actually become isomorphic, um, and, which is why their J invariants are the same even over FP squared. So all of the arithmetic that we would ordinarily use to compute isogenies um, or isogeny-based crypto on the on the A side um, immediately applies to to any uh, any torsion points that and any isogeny arithmetic that Bob wants to use on on the B side. So essentially, there's no changes um, to the underlying uh, to the underlying explicit formulas that that Alice and Bob use. But probably the best piece of news is that we can actually now use uh, finite fields that are much smaller than in the um, original SIDH and psych constructions. Um, so the first observation to, to see why we can do this is to, to recall that the security of SIDH and psych depends uh, more so on the degree of the isogenies that Alice and Bob compute and not on P. And that's because P is so large compared to these degrees. In fact, these degrees are, um, as you can see in the second bullet point, roughly the square root of P. So Alice computes two to the A isogenies, Bob computes three to the B isogenies. And because we're squeezing Alice and Bob into the, um, into the, onto the A side, so, so that their isogeny degrees divide P plus one, um, the prime is is roughly the square of um, their isogeny degrees. But now, if we're going to put Bob on the B side, we only need to squeeze Alice's um, isogeny degree into P plus one, and we can squeeze um, Bob into into P minus one. So as soon as we remove the the factor two that um, is necessarily common to both P plus one and P minus one, then whatever remains is immediately co prime. Um, so Alice can compute M isogenies and Bob can compute N isogenies, um, where now M and N can be the same as before. So the degrees of the isogenies can be the same as before, but now P is uh, roughly the, the square root of what it used to be. Um, so ideally, and in this last bullet point, we, we kind of would like uh, in an ideal world to, to still be able to let Alice compute two to the A isogenies and Bob to, to compute three to the B isogenies um, because these small prime power isogenies are, 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 are currently as it stands the most efficient, the, the, the most efficient ways to go. Uh, but unfortunately the largest prime where M and N can be two to the A and three to the B is 17. Um, and there is no prime larger that is, is squeezed between um, these two, uh, these two and, and two times a three power uh, numbers. So the upshot is that we're going to have to relax the requirement that Alice and Bob uh, must have these two and three power um, isogenies. So since we can't find uh, large enough primes um, where Alice and Bob can still compute their two and three power isogenies, we've got to relax now the requirement um, 
uh, for, for two or three power isogenies and allow Alice and Bob to compute isogenies that are the product of uh, many different prime powers in general. So instead, our goal now uh, is to find primes P, uh, large enough primes, and I'll get to that in a minute, where P plus one and P minus one are both as smooth as possible. Um, and in fact, this is the same or, or very related requirement to the um, to the best paper at this conference. Um, the ski sign construction also requires this primes that are sandwiched between two very smooth numbers. Uh, but another way to, to, to state this problem is to um, look for what we call twin smooths, so two consecutive integers that are that are both smooth. Um, and the special case that we're looking for is when that sum is also the prime p. Um, so I'm going to talk about finding twin smooths because uh, finding twin smooths with a prime sum is just a special case of finding twin smooths. Um, and it turns out that it's it's rather difficult to find primes uh, of cryptographic size that are that are uh, that have p plus or minus one very very smooth. So ideally, we'd like them to be as smooth as possible because their smoothness relates to the efficiency of the uh, subsequent isogeny calculations. Um, but starting with the largest three smooth twins, we saw that on the previous the previous slide. The largest three smooth twins are eight and nine, um, and their sum is seventeen, which is the prime we saw on the on the previous slide. The largest five smooth twins are eighty and eighty one, um, and th again that sum is a prime. But in general, of course, that won't be the case. The largest 113 smooth twins um, have the first, or, uh, both numbers are roughly uh, uh, 2 to the 74. Um, although, the, and their sum wasn't prime. The largest 113 smooth twins that have a prime sum is, a, is a, a, about 8 bits less. In general, what we'd like to do is keep bumping up this smoothness bound until we find ones where M is you know, somewhere close to 256 bits, which is which is roughly the sizes or, or whatever size we're looking for. Uh, but in general, uh, guaranteeing that we've found um, the the smoothest possible, or the or, or rather the largest twins subject to a, a fixed smoothness bound, it requires solving two to the uh, two to the pi of b Pell equations, where pi of b is the number of primes up to b. So I, I think the um, number of primes up to 113 is uh, close to 30. So when I um, computed the largest 113 smooth twins, um, I had to solve two to the 30 Pell equations to be guaranteed that that is indeed the largest, uh, at least according to the um, the best known methods we have, which is a, a a theorem due to Stormer and subsequent uh, subsequent work by Lemma um, shows that yeah we have to solve these two to the pi b Pell equations. So, in fact, computing optimal parameters, the the upshot is that computing optimal parameters where we're guaranteed that these are optimal is is rather difficult, at, at least as far as we know. Um, and so yeah, the 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 lesson from this slide is that finding optimal uh, parameters is in is in fact non-trivial. So I'm going to return to the, the twin smooth problem in a sec, but I'm just going to um, have a brief interlude because there's something that I kind of skimmed over on the previous slide that needs to be discussed. And that is that because we're not, uh, we're no longer using two and three power isogenies, um, the kind of main difference in the security of, uh, of B-side to, to that of SIDH and psych is that we're no longer staying in a fixed L isogeny graph. So here was the um, the two isogeny graph that I promised we were going to see earlier. Um, this is Alice's two isogeny graph where each node has, um, in general, three neighbors, uh, three nodes that it's connected to. Um, and Alice only uses these edges. And, and um, if we move to Bob's three isogeny, graph uh, where each node is in general connected to four neighbors um, again these edges are fixed and Bob only uses these edges in the three isogeny graph in B side we can no longer um, we can no longer just hope to stick with with one prime power we can't hope that Alice has a has a prime power and Bob has a prime power at least uh, we can't hope that they both have prime powers. It, it might be possible in some constructions that either Alice or Bob is a prime power, um, 
but uh, in general, they're going to have their isogeny degrees to be the product of many primes. So uh, uh, it should be said that even even a, with this toy example, um, where the prime p, which was two to the four times three to the three minus one, uh, was chosen so that the two and three isogenies uh, were rational. Um, you can still draw the isogeny graph for any prime you like. So L is five, L is seven, L is 11, and so on. For all of the primes, there's still, a, a, as long as it's co-prime two, I guess, P, um, it, all of these primes, uh, there's still an isogeny graph that exists over these, uh, over these nodes. Um, and so for, for the example, L equals, five, L equals five and L equals seven, I've given two, um, I've given the edges here uh, outgoing from two different nodes, one for L equals five and one for L equals seven. At the, at the L equals five node, you can see six outgoing edges and at the L equals seven node, you can see eight outgoing edges. Um, of course, this is a, a true in general that uh, there's always L plus one um, outgoing edges or, or at least in general, there's L plus one outgoing edges when we're, when we're talking about the prime L uh, because the, the graph, the L isogeny graph is is L plus one uh, regular, and so the kind of inherent conjecture that we're making um, in in the B side construction is that um, Alice and Bob are free to switch between isogeny graphs um, consecutively. So Alice might compute a five isogeny, which would take her to one of six neighbouring nodes, and then from that from that uh, from from the node that she now stands on, she might compute a seven isogeny or an eleven isogeny, or, or uh, and, and so on. Um, the the conjecture we're making is that it's not a problem to do this. That it's um, and I think that to the best of our knowledge, and uh, I hope that uh, the consensus that the, the, the consensus amongst the experts would would agree that um, it's fine to do this uh, because the, the 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 hardness of the problem is dependent on the size of the full isogeny that Alice and Bob compute and not its factorization. Um, the, best, the best known attacks uh, all kind of treat, um, treat the isogeny problem uh, as somewhat of a black box that's independent of its factorization. Um, and so really what you're interested in is how many destination nodes Alice and Bob can both land at. Um, and in this case, the number of destination nodes will roughly be the same as it is in SIDH and Psych um, if, we, if we make the isogeny degrees the same. Um, and so the, the, the assumption here is that uh, Alice and Bob are, are fine to, at, at successive steps, to be taking a step with, with uh, some prime degree isogeny and then immediately taking a step with a different prime. Now, it could turn out that future cryptanalysis shows that this is not a good idea. Um, but as I say in the paper, it could also turn out that it that, that it, it's a it's an even better idea than sticking in the L isogeny graph. Um, at the moment, it's it's not very clear, uh, but I think I, I, I hope that uh, expert consensus would be that it's um, it's actually irrelevant uh, as far as the the security or the, the the best known attacks are concerned. So now returning back to our problem of searching for, for twin smooths to try and instantiate the, the B-side construction. Um, on this slide, you'll see some, uh, some probabilities that are related to um, some concrete choices of parameters. So suppose we're looking for numbers that are roughly 256 bits in size, um, or for twin smooths that are roughly 256 bits in size, where the smoothness bound is uh, two to the 16. So they're allowed to have any prime factor that's that's less than two to the 16. Um, and in blue, in the blue uh, rectangles, we're assuming that that's the um, that's parts of the number or the full number itself that is that is B smooth. And and in the orange, we're um, saying that this is not smooth. So the three methods that I've uh, discussed in the paper. Uh, the first one is the most naive method that, that one could think of, and that is to, to search over smooth values of M. So to construct smooth values of M that we that we uh, just take products of any primes that are that are less than two to the sixteen and, and loop over all such products until we find one where either M plus one or M minus one is smooth. 
Um, now, some sort of basic smoothness probabilities can tell us that the that the rough uh, probability of finding such a, a a twin smooth in this way is roughly two to the negative seventy. Um, so it's kind of like no hope of no hope of searching for um, for twin smooths of this size using that method. The second method um, uses the extended GCD approach. So if you look at um, the extended Euclidean algorithm, what you can actually do is take uh, roughly a square root of um, each of the numbers to be smooth um, and then hope that the other half of these two numbers are smooth. So you can choose both A and B to be roughly 2 to the 128. Um, they've got to be co-prime. And then you can compute the numbers that come out of the extended uh, Euclidean algorithm, uh, the numbers S and T, and hope that S and T are both uh, smooth as well. Now, in doing this, the probability of, of smoothness is roughly 2 to the negative 50. So it's a, it's a little bit better, but the, the chances of um, these two orange uh, chunks of the numbers being, being B smooth is still rather low. Um, so the best method that I could come up with in this paper, the one that was most successful in finding uh, smooth parameters, was to instead search for um, M and M minus 1 to be uh, x to the n and x to the n minus 1, where n is some small integer, like 6. Um, the reason it needs to be small is that if it's too large, there's not enough x values to search over. Um, and if it's too small, like 2, then we kind of get back to one of the situations above where the probability of smoothness is really small. So in searching for m is x to the 6, we're actually only looking for a number that's roughly 2 to the 43 to be smooth. Um, and then the factorization of x to the 6 minus 1 means that we're looking for two more numbers of roughly that size to be smooth, and then two other numbers that r relate to those quadratic terms that are that are twice as big or have twice the bit length to be smooth as well. And in doing that, our probability of smoothness becomes a lot better. But the best method known to date um, of searching for twin smooths is uh, subsequent research that uh, was done with Michael Meyer and Michael Narig. Um, very recently, we've developed a, a sieving algorithm that uh, performs much better um, asymptotically and, and for the sizes of the primes that we're that we're looking for. Um, so I'm briefly going to touch on that. The idea is similar to the to the third method on the previous slide, but to instead use polynomials uh, ax and bx to, that that differ by one um, that are completely that are completely split over uh, uh, the polynomial ring over the rationals q of x. Um, so there's an example of, of such a degree six example where ax and bx are both uh, degree six polynomials that are completely split. Um, and this really improves the probability of finding, uh, finding smooth twins um, at, at the cryptographic sizes. The difficulty in that construction is actually finding the, pro uh, the, the polynomials ax and bx themselves. Um, but if, if you can do that, which we, which we know how to do for certain degrees up to 12, then the probability of smoothness is a lot better. And you can see one of the, one of the best examples we found was the 250-bit prime below, where p plus 1 and p minus 1 uh, were both 2 to the 15 smooth. Um, and so if you want to take a look at that work, you can, you can look at the archive uh, address given there. So probably the easiest way to get a high level uh, snapshot view of the security of B-side is to kind of contrast it or to compare it to the security of the original SIDH construction. So on the left here, or in fact in both cases I've fabricated a little mini uh, super singular isogeny graph or at least the nodes. Um, and the red, let's, let's say that the red dot in both cases is the starting curve or the starting node. And the blue dots represent the set of target, uh, the set of possible destination nodes that Alice and Bob could walk to with a with a secret isogeny. So in the case of SIDH on the left, these nodes form uh, uh, they're roughly uh, square root the size of the, the you know the number of nodes in the full graph. So Alice and Bob can only really reach a, a square root of of the full set 
of, of nodes, um, which is why we don't use the general algorithms, um, the general isogeny algorithms for, for trying to solve the problem, which is why there's better algorithms for solving the SIDH problem. In particular, we use these meet in the middle claw finding algorithms, um, both classically and quantumly. And, and the security analysis of both of these shows that it's a it's big of O of P to the one quarter and big, big O of P to the one sixth, if you ignore the memory requirements. Um, now in practice, nowadays we, we know that uh, the, the, the all things considered, in, in particular memory considered as well, that the best classical attack at least is the, the, the Van Oshot Wiener algorithm. Um, but in any case, this, these, all of these algorithms are, 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 are specific and, and not general, um, so they can't be used to solve the general isogeny problem, but they're tailored to the, to the types of uh, isogenies that are used in SIDH. In B side now, um, we've got much fewer nodes in the, in the graph, but we've got roughly the same amount of destination nodes. And in particular, um, the number of destination nodes is now much closer to the full set of nodes in the graph. Um, if you recall, there's, rough, there's roughly P over 12 um, nodes in the isogeny graph and, uh, and Alice and Bob take walks that are both roughly uh, uh, that, that, that roughly uh, can can land you at O of P um, O of P destination nodes so maybe there's a handful of nodes that they can't walk to for technical reasons but in general they kind of cover a, a fraction that's much closer to one of the full the full graph and this shows why or this is kind of related to the reason why we can um, attack the, the problem using the, uh, the general isogeny algorithms. In particular, the, the, the classical algorithm due to Delson Galbraith, which, which runs in big O of P to the one half, and its quantum, um, its quantum variant due to Biasi, Jao, and Sankar, which is uh, basically Delson Galbraith uh, with Grover, uh, uh, with Grover's algorithm to get the square root speed up. Um, these algorithms solve the general problem, and, and uh, but they're both memory free, so neither of them require um, any sort of um, big memory, uh, big memory to run. Um, they're both perfectly parallelizable, um, and that the big O in their in their cost it just hides the cost of the isogeny oracle. So if you can get the um, the concrete costs of an isogeny oracle classically or quantumly, then you can basically write down a concrete cost of the of the best known algorithms for solving the general problem. Um, but what it essentially does is it really nicely matches um, the NIST uh, the NIST requirements uh, for level one security, for example, matching AS one twenty eight because um, this this square root relationship between the classical and quantum complexities means we can we can choose parameters quite easily in in B side. Um, there is one caveat here, and it's a, it's related to the fact that both of these algorithms will just return some path um, between the two nodes, which will probably not uh, be the path that Alice or Bob actually took. Um, so what we're assuming here is to just to be safe that these paths can be modified to um, output the uh, the path that Alice and Bob took um, and can be used to actually solve the underlying cryptographic problem. Um, so we're, we're kind of making a conservative assumption there that, that, the, that those algorithms will, uh, will be able to be modified to, to produce the, the, um, the secret keys. Of course, at, this, at least in this talk, I'm uh, rather biased to B-side, especially if I'm comparing it to SIDH and PSYCH. Um, the pros are that the smaller primes, the, the primes that you know could be close to half the size or roughly half the size, they end up giving smaller public keys, um, even if you take compression into account in SIDH and PSYCH. Um, uh, in our case, the there's nothing to be gained from compression so you get you get some simplicity in b-side because the public keys are already as compressed as possible the the scalars that you might use to compute the, the secret scalars that you might use to compute these public keys are roughly the same size as the finite field 
because Alice and Bob, um, their their walk sizes are roughly the same as as P. Um, and so there's nothing to be gained for compression. So you kind of avoid that overhead of, of compression. Um, the security analysis is arguably um, cleaner than the, the security analysis of SIDH and psych and certainly of other post-quantum primitives. Um, and one other nice thing is that the hybrid security that you gain uh, matches the, so the, the classical security that you might gain from doing an, an ECC hybrid over the same finite field uh, matches perfectly with the conjectured quantum and classical security of the, of the post-quantum primitive. Um, so if you, if you also do ECC over the same field that you'd use in B-side, then the classical ECC security that you get is the same as the classical and uh, comparable quantum security that you get from B-side. The main con right now, which is the, the, the main direction for future work, is that the efficiency is, is um, nowhere near as, as good as uh, SIDH and, and psych, at least if you're, if you're balancing the case for Alice and Bob where they, they both get um, you know, uh, uh, isogeny degrees that aren't as smooth as SIDH and psych isogeny degrees, then um, the efficiency is, is a lot worse as it currently stands, but some, some really exciting recent work by Arj, Chai Dominguez and Rodriguez Henriquez um, that's that's on the archive shows that this um, this gap is a is a, a certainly a as it stands quite close a, a fair bit closer than what I was expecting and um, is encouraging for for future work for B side. What's unclear at the moment is that uh, whether or not the security of jumping between um, different prime degree isogenies that I was talking about earlier whether that is a problem or whether whether it's a feature or whether it's a bug. Um, and also whether smaller p uh, introduces attacks that I didn't consider in the security analysis. So there could be attacks that are better than Delft's Galbraith or better than uh, BRCJ and Sankar in the quantum sense um, that apply to B-side. As far as future work goes, uh, I guess it all comes down to really trying to make B-side and B-psych as fast as possible. Um, so the most obvious direction to do that is to look for better parameters because if you can find uh, parameters that are um, much smoother than the parameters that we've found, then this translates directly into, into very noticeable speed ups. Basically, the uh, very roughly speaking, the, the efficiency of B-side is just heavily dependent on the, on the smoothness bound that you use to find the parameters. So the, the smoother parameters would be, would be uh, the, the the easiest way to get to get B-side a lot faster. Um, one area that's probably more ambitious is to see if the O of square root uh, square root of L isogeny complexity, asymptotic isogeny complexity, can be can be made even better. And if that happens, then that'll be an, uh, yet another boost for for B-side um, that that might be able to make it as performant as as SIDH. Cheers.